What's going on everyone? Little bit different of an intro today. I'm alone in my car in the middle of the night. I'm also in a undisclosed location. Now, I was originally heading to Walmart. The reason why I need to go to Walmart is you already know, I need some Tylenol because we're gonna turn Tylenol into a general anesthetic, which is called propofol. Propofol is generally used in surgical procedures and various other ones to have controlled unconsciousness. Basically, it gives you the Mike Tyson treatment or the Bill Cosby treatment, depending on how you look at it. I think it's pretty cool. Well, not, not the Bill Cosby treatment, but that it's used in hospitals and general procedures. Now, a little background on why I'm making propofol is a viewer sent in a video request saying that he wanted me to make it. Generally, when I get emails, people want me to make fentanyl or other illegal drugs, but this one was unscheduled and legal to make. So I had to make it. Now, one of the best parts is when I was doing my research, I found a paper where they took Tylenol and they turned it into propofol. Originally, I was gonna show a video of me driving to Walmart, getting the Tylenol, and then doing the video. However, when I got to Walmart, it was already closed, which I thought Walmart was open 24 hours. Now, the thing that confused me was there was multiple cars in the parking lot. Now, I think they were having sex. I was extremely jealous, but I was bummed that Walmart was closed. Now, it is kind of my fault. It is the middle of the night. However, there's another store near me called Winko Foods and Winko Foods is open 24 hours. I also think Winko is probably the best place on earth, besides Snow Bunny Heaven, and I can get my Tylenol there. So I'm gonna take a video when I get there of me grabbing some Tylenol, and then we can get started with the video. And I think it's gonna be a pretty good video. What we first need to do is break this out of the bottle and crush them up into powder. 7.62 grams of Tylenol tablets was measured out, with filler and all. The paper mentioned that you didn't need to separate out the acetaminophen and just base tablets could be used. I then transferred the crushed Tylenol tablets into a 500 milliliter round bottom boiling flask. This was also the two neck design, with absolutely no losses. When that was finished, 7.5 milliliters of isopropyl alcohol was added. This is going to be very important for a first reaction. Next, 30 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid was added into the flask. Immediately upon contact, the sulfuric acid and acetaminophen tablets created this smoke or vapor. We can also see the introduction of a slight color change at the bottom of the flask. This originally started as a dark yellow and eventually changed. After just a few minutes, we can see this purple color change that's happening in the flask. This color was also mentioned in the procedure, so it made me extremely happy to see. I also put a stir bar into the reaction flask, as we're going to need pretty strong vigorous stirring later in the procedure. The next thing that I had to do was stir this for 30 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius. What should be happening right now is a biz alkylation of two isopropyl groups. All of this will make sense later in the mechanism. After those 30 minutes, we now need to add 30 milliliters of distilled water. This is going to be important as we need this for our second reaction where we do an acid hydrolysis of the acetamide group. Also, immediately upon the addition of water, our temperature shot up to 91 degrees Celsius. This is because we're adding water to the acid and doing so will increase the temperature. What I need to do now is bring this up to a reflux and reflux for three hours straight. And to do this, all I have is a reflux condenser and I have a temperature probe that tracks the temperature. As things started to heat up, our reflux slowly started to present itself to us. When I looked into the flask, it was this dark goopy thing that I'm pretty sure is gonna turn into tar. In the reflux condenser, we can also see this vapor starting to edge itself consistently. After the three hour reflux, I'm gonna add 75 milliliters of distilled water to the flask. The purpose of this is to stop the precipitation of an ammonium salt, which is what we don't want. Also not so surprising, the concentrated sulfuric acid absolutely ate through my temperature probe. I can't wait to see the impurities. We're left with this extremely dark liquid that has a couple impurities in there, probably from the temperature probe, or any of the insoluble fillers that they put in the acetaminophen tablets. Before we move on to our next reaction, I needed to cool this in an ice bath and then vigorously stir it. 
the cooling is extremely important. What we need to do now is add 7.06 grams of sodium nitrite. It has to be added slowly and portion-wise. What we're doing now is forming a nitrozonium ion. We need this for the third reaction. You'll also see that red-looking vapor in there that's coming out. This is likely nitrogen dioxide. The procedure did mention that it was cooled in an ice bath and then the sodium nitrite was added, but perhaps they meant that it needed to be in an ice bath as I added the sodium nitrite. Once all the sodium nitrite was added portion-wise, I let it stir for 30 minutes at room temperature. The final main reagent that we need is zinc powder. The reason that we need the zinc powder is to act as a final reduction before we have our propofol. Again, all of this will make sense once I give the mechanism, so stay with me, okay? I have to add the zinc powder portion-wise and slowly, and I added 15.24 grams of zinc powder. I also observed a vapor slash gas coming out and likely this is nitrogen gas. It's also likely mixed with something else too. It was also interesting as every time I did a zinc powder addition, it would float on the surface for a little bit and then eventually disappear. There was never a vigorous reaction and just a vapor was produced. Eventually, after adding most of the zinc, it did turn this lighter brown color. So I assume something did happen. Now you're just going to hold your horses really quick, because we need to go over the mechanism. Now this is a one pot synthesis, however, there's four main mechanisms that are happening. This is a lot of info, so stay with me now, okay? Starting with the first reaction, we're going to take acetaminophen, and we're going to react this with isopropyl alcohol and sulfuric acid. This will do a biz alkylation. What this means is this will undergo a friedel crafts alkylation where the two highlighted red isopropyl groups will be added. Now, how does this actually work? Let's go over that. First, isopropyl alcohol will be protonated by the sulfuric acid. Water can then leave as a leaving group and then a carbocation will be created. This can undergo electrophilic aromatic substitution and these isopropyl groups will be added on. You might also be confused as to why the isopropyl group goes right there and not anywhere else. Starting from this hydroxyl group, if we go one carbon over, this is the ortho position. If we go two carbons over, that is the meta position. And if we go three carbons over, that is the para position. This is important as we need both of the isopropyl groups to be ortho to the hydroxyl group. Starting with acetaminophen, we already have this N-acetyl group right here, which can serve as a blocking position. When doing electrophilic aromatic substitutions, this hydroxyl group is known as an activating group. And when we add an electrophile, it will either go ortho or para to the hydroxyl group. And since the N-acetyl group is already blocking the para position, both of the isopropyl groups will go to the ortho position. This will be repeated again, and we have another isopropyl group added ortho to the hydroxyl group. And that's what gives us our biz alkylation. In the second reaction, we're now going to do an acid hydrolysis of the acetamide group. How this works is that our carbonyl oxygen will first be protonated by the acid. Water can then attack the carbonyl carbon, pushing electrons towards the positively charged oxygen. There is then proton transfer from water and the new positively charged oxygen. The nitrogen from the former amide can now pick up a proton and be protonated. This makes it an excellent leaving group and a carbonyl will be reformed, kicking this out as an amine leaving group. There will then be a proton transfer, either from the newly formed amine or the environment's water with this intermediate. And this creates a primary ammonium ion, which is our final structure in mechanism two. The purpose of the third reaction is to make a diazonium ion with sodium nitrite and water. First, when we put sodium nitrite in an acidic environment, it's going to make something called a nitrozonium ion. How this works is the nitri ion will first pick up a proton on the negatively charged oxygen. This newly formed hydroxyl group will then pick up another proton, creating a leaving group which is known as water. Once water leaves, we then have our nitrozonium ion, which is ready to be used. Do you remember when I said we had that ammonium ion at the end? Well, this is also an equilibrium, and it can also be in its protonated or deprotonated form. Once it's in its primary amine or deprotonated state, it can then use the nitrozonium ion and it attacks it. Water will then deprotonate this nitrous ammonium ion and a stable intermediate known as N-nitrosamine is formed. 
Then, the oxygen on the N nitrous amine is protonated, and a proton on the nitrogen is removed by water to form a double bond between the nitrogen atoms. The oxygen is then protonated again, forming an excellent leaving group, which is just water, and the departure of water produces a diazonium ion, which is ready to be used in our last mechanism. Now, the last mechanism, I'm kind of just taking a guess at. I don't know if it's a radical that's formed or not, but this is just how I think it happens. If anybody knows, please put it down in the comments. I would love to learn what this actually is. In reaction four, all we're gonna do is add some zinc powder, which will reduce this diazonium ion to propofol. I tried looking this up, but I don't exactly know what's happening. But what I think happens is zinc will donate two of its valence electrons to the positively charged nitrogen and it will leave as nitrogen gas. This would create an aryl anion which just abstracts the hydrogen proton from the environment and thus giving us propofol. Again, I don't actually know if this is the mechanism, but fuck it we ball and we'll see what happens. The last thing I had to do was simply add 150 milliliters of ethanol, which immediately produced a ton of vapors and bubbling. It threw me off initially, as they never mentioned this in the procedure, but, you know, sometimes that just happens. I mean, I, I thought it was pretty cool, though. It was also extremely frothy, kind of like you took a piss with kidney dysfunction. Also, a huge amount of bubbles, and there's so many reagents in this flask, I don't exactly know what reaction is happening. All I have to do now is let this stir overnight at room temperature. Next, we're going to set up for a short path distillation, as we first need to get the ethanol and then the steam distillation of propofol. When I first started heating things up, the ethanol decided to come over around 78 through 82 degrees Celsius. The paper describes this as a ethanol-rich distillate, so I'm assuming that there's other things besides ethanol. After all of the ethanol-rich distillate was collected, the paper describes at 100 degrees Celsius is when our propofol mixture should start to come over. So, at about 98 degrees Celsius, I decided to switch the flask over. Propofol is an oily liquid, so we should see this on top of the water. At first glance, I really didn't see anything happening. It just looked like some cloudy water. However, shortly after, I started to notice these oily droplets coming over. The paper mentions that it's a pale yellow oil that should be floating on the surface. And by all means, was a pale yellow oil floating on the surface. As time went on, it did decide to change colors to orange. I really didn't know if propofol was air sensitive or not, or if there was oxidation occurring, but it did turn out to be orange. As the distillation was coming to an end, it did start to get a little more bumpy in the flask, and it was having a hard time getting water all the way over. The paper never mentioned that it added more water to it, but I think that would have been a good idea. And near the end of the distillation, we can see this oily liquid just floating on the surface kind of spread out. I've always found steam distillations to be quite unique, and it just looked really cool coming over. Once everything was collected, I was ready to extract. I poured our aqueous layer into a separatory funnel, and then I'm going to use ethyl acetate as the organic solvent. I washed the original receiving flask with ethyl acetate to make sure I got all of the propofol coming over. 100 milliliters of ethyl acetate was used to extract our propofol from our aqueous layer. I collected the organic layer and I extracted two more times from the aqueous layer. Each extraction after the first seemed to be fairly clear in the ethyl acetate and it pretty much cleared up our aqueous layer. Once I collected all three 100 milliliter ethyl acetate extractions, I thought I wanted to clean this up a little bit. So, one of my ideas was to use activated charcoal to take any color impurities out. I'm not exactly sure if it will do anything, but I thought it wouldn't hurt. I also added some sodium sulfate to it so we could dry out our organic solvent. I was originally supposed to wash twice with brine, but I thought this would be enough. I just made sure to use a little extra sodium sulfate. After that stirred for a couple hours, I decided to filter through some cotton and some silica. I was hoping this would filter out some of the color that the charcoal didn't get, so I was hoping it worked. And it would also filter out the charcoal and sodium sulfate. And, hopefully, any of the color that the charcoal missed. Once everything was filtered, I decided to set up for vacuum distillation. 
Now, the only problem with vacuum distillation is my pump doesn't really have a regulator and it just eats all of the solvent. You can see me pulling a vacuum right now, however, nothing goes in the receiving flask as I don't have dry ice and it's not really easy for me to get. Usually, you would use a cold trap to stop vapors going into your vacuum. The only problem is nothing would even go into the receiving flask, so I had to stop my vacuum. So I didn't kill my vacuum, I just decided to do a regular distillation, even though the paper says to do a vacuum on or a rotary vap. It seemed to be going just fine for a while, and even the color of the liquid didn't change. It was still that nice yellowish color that I know what propofol looks like. However, near the end, I was having some issues, and I decided to pull a vacuum just to get everything out. I think it may have been too hot in the heating mantle, and potentially air sensitive, and as it got lower and lower, the oil kind of turned into this orangish color. And eventually, it turned this orange red. I was definitely very annoyed, as I know doing a simple distillation was kind of a gamble. It was also quite opaque, and it just didn't look right. I really need to buy a better vacuum or get a rotary vap. I'm not sure if it was air sensitive and oxidation happened or thermal degradation, but I need to clean this up. So I decided to do a vacuum distillation as my vacuum is extremely well at high boiling point liquids. So I set it for a short path vacuum distillation and I hope for the best. As I pull the vacuum and things started to heat up, there is this liquid that started to reflux in the flask. It was quite clear and looked pretty oily. This was obviously a very good sign, though it was having a little bit of trouble getting it up the condenser, and I know what that feels like. Though, if I just turned the stir bar up as high as I could go, and it moved around like this, it actually started to distill over. An absolute 200 IQ move. What was coming over was much more translucent and oily. Now, it also was a yellowish orange color, but I'm not really sure what that means but it was definitely better than orangish red. Some of the main problems was actually getting it caught in this neck of the flask. It seemed like it just wanted to keep condensing in that area and not really go up the condenser. I know I lost a little bit of it as I could see some oil, but it just wouldn't go over. Though overall, I would say it looks infinitely better and I'm pretty glad I did this. Chromatography probably would have worked really well, however, I really just didn't feel like doing it. I tried using a white piece of paper to show you the color of the propofol, and it's a yellowish orange. You can also see in our boiling flask that we have this disgusting impurity, which pretty much makes sense why our original product looks so gross. And honestly, I really don't know what that is. Overall, we got this nice translucent oil, and I'm pretty happy with it. I am genuinely curious as to what the impurity is that makes it orange. I am sending this to Brent over at More Analytical to see what this actually is. This does have a phenol-like smell, and I'm pretty hopeful that this is propofol. The yield is 1.20 grams, and the percent yield is 15.5. Now, the percent yield from the paper was 50%, but they only did it on a gram scale. I'm not sure if it scales up poorly, or if I needed to add more water during the steam distillation, which I really think I would have gotten more propofol out of it. I also decided to do thin layer chromatography as the paper gave their RF value. It does not show it very well, but you get the point. Based on the paper, the RF value for propofol is 0.75. This top dot right here has an RF value of exactly 0.75. This definitely supports the evidence that we have propofol. The only problem is we have this bottom dot with an RF value of 0.63. What this means is we unfortunately have a more polar impurity. I don't exactly know what this is, so that's why I want the GCMS, which Brent over at More Analytical kindly said he would do. Now all I have to do is just wait. Overall, very fun video to do, and you know what? Have a good day guys, because I'm done talking now.